Ether, the native currency of the Ethereum blockchain, is perhaps the greatest financial asset of all time. What a crazy statement. Really? Yes. Ether has properties never before seen in any other financial asset in history, which is why everyone should consider it as a necessary part of their portfolio. In this video, we're going to talk about what makes ETH so special. Is it really the world's greatest asset? How do you even measure that? And where does it get its value from? Why is it worth $2,000 now? And why will it be worth more in the future? And how is Ether similar to other types of assets like gold, oil, equities, or money? And also what's so unique about it? And why in this massive sea of shitty crypto assets, tokens, coins, NFTs, is ETH positioned to be the future currency of the internet? We all own and buy different kinds of assets in our portfolio. We buy equities like Apple or commodities like oil. And if you're a boomer, you like treasuries or bonds. And if we want to understand Ether as an asset, we need to define the asset superclasses that all assets fall into, because there are three. First, capital assets. These assets are the gifts that keep on giving. Owning these assets produce some sort of reoccurring revenue, yield, or dividend for their owners. For example, owning a house can produce rental income. Some stocks provide quarterly dividends. Treasury bonds pay you to own them. Any asset that produces more money just by owning it is a capital asset. Second, Commodity assets. Commodity assets are things with physical utility, things that you need to use or that you consume. Oil, wheat, lumber, coffee, metals, and of course the big one, energy. These are assets that you need to consume to get something done. And lastly, third, store of value assets. These are things that do a good job of preserving their value over time. Things like real estate, fine art, gold, or currencies like the dollar or euro. And if you were paying attention, you notice that real estate is both a store of value and a capital asset. Houses are a good store of wealth, but you can also rent out a house or an apartment and receive a rental income as a yield. Similarly, gold is both a good store of value and a commodity that's useful inside of various industries. So some assets fall into multiple asset categories and they receive a premium for being in multiple asset categories all at once. They have two reasons as to what makes them so valuable. Now, no asset has ever fallen into all three asset categories ever until now. Ether is a store of value inside of DeFi, the world of decentralized finance. It is the premier collateral, the money that's used inside of DeFi applications. It's also the currency that's used to trade tokens on decentralized exchanges. It's the money that lets you do things inside of crypto. Ethereum is building out an alternative financial system. And just like you need dollars in TradFi, traditional finance, you need ETH to do things in DeFi. Ether is also a capital asset. You may have heard about Ethereum's proof of stake and how you can stake ETH to earn a yield. This is in contrast to proof of work, which consumes electricity to secure Bitcoin. Proof of stake lets people bond their ETH to participate in validating transactions and pays out a yield to those that do making Ethereum staking a native internet bond market that provides capital to Ethereum. And lastly, Ether is the currency that you consume to use Ethereum. Cars use gasoline, your computer uses electricity, and Ethereum uses ETH. ETH is the commodity that gets consumed anytime anyone wants to make a transaction on the Ethereum network. Different actions will cost different amounts of ETH on Ethereum. Simply sending Ether or tokens to another crypto address is very simple and very cheap. Other things like asset trading or options markets become more complex and therefore require more ETH to pay for the transaction fee. ETH is the energy that powers the financial side of the metaverse. And so to recap, we have Ether as a store of value because it's the dominant collateral inside of DeFi. Ether is a capital asset because you can stake it to earn a yield. And it's also the currency that you need to spend to do anything on Ethereum. These three things produce the three pillars of Ether, the three different ways it captures value from its surrounding ecosystem and directs that value into the price of ETH. And of course, there are the three reasons why I'm super bullish on ETH. Let's take each pillar one by one so we can really unpack how each one adds to the fundamental value of Ether. First, pillar number one. Ether in DeFi. DeFi, or decentralized finance, is the first major utility to come out of crypto after cryptocurrency in its most basic form, which is Bitcoin. When Ethereum was invented, it created a platform to create smart contracts. And DeFi, decentralized finance, is basically just applied smart contracts. The traditional finance system, or what we call in crypto, TradFi, is built upon financial contracts. And some contracts are automated like a marketplace, like options contracts, but others are contracts that are just manually written by lawyers. But the idea here is it's contracts all the way down. DeFi is a financial system built by smart contracts and ETH is the currency that runs through this system. In this financial system, there are various applications which are sets of connected smart contracts that together do something useful. For example, there's MakerDAO, which is like a decentralized bank 
And as a model, we can go back in time to when the Federal Reserve had gold deposits and they issued dollars against these deposits. Gold in, dollars out. They would mint dollars if they had enough gold in the bank to back these dollars. Then, in the 1970s, we defaulted because we were printing too much money to finance the Vietnam War. President Nixon closed the credit window and the US dollar has been inflating ever since. MakerDAO is a system like that, except it can't default because it's controlled by smart contracts, not humans. The code doesn't allow the bank to default by default. So you can put $1,500 of Ether into MakerDAO and you can borrow a thousand DAI using Ether as collateral. DAI is a dollar pegged stablecoin, meaning it's always worth $1 and anyone can mint DAI so long as they have the Ether to put up as collateral to back the DAI. So where there was once gold backing dollars, there is now Ether backing DAI. And as Maker grows, more and more Ether comes into its vaults to produce more DAI because other people in the world of DeFi want or need DAI for whatever purpose. Maybe they hold it because it's stable. Maybe they're using it in another DeFi app. Demand for DAI comes from the broader DeFi ecosystem. And as a result of that demand, more Ether finds itself inside of MakerDAO because you need this Ether as collateral to mint DAI in the first place. Uniswap is like the Ethereum stock exchange where you can trade any tokens on Ethereum. And this is where you could trade Ether for DAI. And Uniswap itself requires Ether to be deposited into it because Ether is the currency that all these assets trade against. There's also applications like Aave or Compound, which let you deposit assets into a common pool with other depositors. And then borrowers can borrow these assets from these pools for whatever reason they need to. And then they pay an interest rate to those depositors. And of course, since ETH is the native currency of Ethereum, Ether is the most commonly deposited asset into these applications. These are all normal financial applications that Wall Street has used all the time. But these applications are available to people like you and me on the internet and are managed by smart contracts and not stupid humans who cause financial crises like in 2008. As DeFi grows, more apps come to place more demand on ETH because basically every single DeFi application starts by depositing ether into it. And then it finds a way to produce something new and valuable with that deposited ETH. And this is why Ether makes one of the strongest doors of value in the crypto space. Owning Ether in your portfolio opens up the doors of DeFi to you because all DeFi applications are competing with each other for you to put your Ether in their smart contracts. Ether is the native currency of Ethereum and this makes it the most desired asset in all of DeFi. And when all of DeFi demands Ether to be used as collateral, EFI becomes the store of value that DeFi runs on and boom, that is the first pillar. Ether is the store of value asset for the internet native economy. Next up, pillar number two, staked Ether, or the total supply of Ether that is staked to Ethereum. Ethereum has replaced proof of work with proof of stake. The way that proof of work works is that it forces miners into alignment with Bitcoin by making them burn electricity. Why this works is that if a miner tries to attack Bitcoin by trying to change the blockchain, they end up just burning electricity for nothing and they forfeit all of their rewards to the miners who stayed honest, so long as 51% of all the miners miners were honest, which is why we call this a 51% attack. Proof of stake removes all of that mess with just one simple mechanism, staking ether. Instead of being a miner and consuming electricity, you can stake your ether on a normal computer or even a Raspberry Pi. Staking ETH means you bond it to the Ethereum network so you can process transactions, add blocks to the blockchain and earn block rewards and transaction fees for doing so. You stake ether, meaning you put your ether at stake on the promise that you're going to follow the rules and not try and fork the chain aka being bad. And if you decide to be bad, you get by publishing an invalid block, then you get your ether slashed. What all this means on a technical level is more complicated and out of scope for this video. We'll do a deep dive into proof of stake in the future, which is why you should be subscribed to Bankless. So you stake your ether, and then you get to process the transactions on the Ethereum network. And you get rewarded both by the new issuance of Ether and transaction tips. So when Ethereum becomes congested and transaction fees are super high, you can earn tips from people who want to jump the line, kind of like Uber's surge pricing. And that adds to the yield that you get as an ETH staker. The current ETH yield for staking is about 5%, but that can fluctuate based on the usage of Ethereum. When the demand to use Ethereum goes up, it produces a higher yield for stakers. And in times of high gas prices, that yield can increase to 7% or even into double digits. We'll see, we don't have a lot of data right now. Importantly, ETH stakers are not lending out their ether. They're not giving it away or letting someone else borrow it. It's being staked to the Ethereum protocol. There's no one else on the other side of that. There's no counterparty risk. No one is being trusted here. And this is why we call the ETH stake rate the risk-free rate of the internet. It's like a government bond. It's risk-free because the government can always pay its debts by issuing money, but it's even better because the issuance is controlled by an autonomous algorithm that can't be manipulated by political influence. 
It's algorithmic monetary policy, and it's out of the hands of humans and controlled by the market. So here's how this is bullish for ETH. The more ETH that's staked to Ethereum by people who want to get that sweet, sweet ETH yield, the less ETH there is on the secondary market. The native yield that Ethereum gives Ether is the incentive that the protocol creates to lock up ETH and stake it to the network and provide Ethereum with economic security. And the reason you do this, of course, is because if you're really bullish on ETH, the thing that you want the most is more ETH. So all the ETH balls take all of their Ether off the secondary markets and they stake it, providing Ethereum with security and they help drive value into Ether due to that demand for ETH staking. And boom, that's the second value capture pillar of ETH, demand for staked ETH. And lastly, the last pillar, and honestly the most fun, the ETH burn. When someone makes a transaction on Ethereum, that transaction fee is burnt. It's gone, it gets consumed. Ether is the energy that powers Ethereum. It's called gas for a reason. All transactions on Ethereum require Ether for payment. And when Ether is spent on a transaction fee, it gets removed from supply. Just like the gasoline in your car, it gets used up as it powers the engine. Maybe you're asking, why? Why does it get burned? First, blockchains must charge some fee to use it as a spam prevention mechanism. Since Ethereum is globally accessible and permissionless, it needs some sort of filter to limit the transactions it includes into the blockchain. And blockchains use a fee market to do that filtering. Transactions that pay higher fees are objectively more important because someone is willing to pay more to get that transaction included into the blockchain. And we can't just include every transaction all at once because that would make Ethereum basically a centralized database. That constraint on data is what allows Ethereum to be decentralized. And again, subscribe to Bankless for when we do a video on that topic later. So a fee market emerges in order to prioritize the most important transactions. When you make a transaction to Ethereum, it gets processed by a validator who earns a block reward and all the tips that come with that transaction. And then that block must be stored by everyone who is keeping a copy of the global Ethereum ledger. We call these things nodes. Everyone who runs an Ethereum node stores a copy of every transaction that's ever been made on Ethereum. And when you transact on Ethereum, you're adding data to the blockchain, which represents a small, but real cost to the global Ethereum network. So in order to pay for that cost, your Ether is burnt because you are paying the network to store your transaction data. When Ether is burnt, it's paid to the network as a whole. It's kind of like a, a stock buyback. Ethereum, the blockchain, sells its product, which is Blockspace, for people to put their transactions inside of. And it collects revenue from these transactions, which it uses to buy back and burn Ether, making Ether more scarce the more that Ethereum as a network is used. And boom, that's the third pillar. Ethereum network activity burns Ether. And so there it is. Those are the three pillars of value accrual for ETH. One, yield paid to ETH stakers for people who stake their ETH. Second, ETH utility in DeFi incentivizes people to use their Ether as collateral. And lastly, Ether is burnt the more that Ethereum is used. Proof of stake wants you to stake your ETH. DeFi wants you to deposit your ETH. And the burn, well, the burn wants to burn your ETH. Everything about the Ethereum protocol wants your ETH. And this shows up in the secondary market as value, as price, as a number that hopefully goes up. And these three pillars all correlate with the three asset superclasses, store of value, capital assets, and commodity assets. And Ether is the only asset to transcend all three asset superclasses all at once. And this is why we call Ether the triple point asset thesis is a thesis that we here at Bankless coined back in 2019. And it has become the fundamental investment thesis into Ether for the entire crypto industry. We've been bullish on ETH for a while because there's really no asset like it. Some assets do share synergies across multiple asset superclasses. I mentioned gold and real estate earlier, but no asset before ETH has ever derived value from all three categories all at once. The demand drivers from each utility of ETH compound on each other, making each one more powerful. And why many in the crypto space are convinced, myself included, that Ether is the new money for the digital age. And that's because Ethereum is the platform that hosts economies in the metaverse, virtual economies for the virtual worlds that we all know are coming, especially when technologies like virtual reality intersect with internet finance on Ethereum. And since Ether is the native currency of Ethereum, it would make sense if Ether also became the native currency of the metaverse. These are some of the theses and ideas we've been putting forth here at Bankless. We coined the triple point asset in 2019. We defined the metaverse in 2021. And that's because Bankless isn't a news agency. We're not journalists. We're a thesis-driven media company leading the charge into the crypto frontier. Your average crypto YouTuber just reports on events and talks about the news. But at Bankless, we create the news. We spawn the ideas. We are at the basement level 
And that's why you should subscribe to this channel. And also the long form Bankless YouTube channel, because that's where you'll hear all the alpha about crypto as close to the source as possible. If you like this video, we're already busy making more of them. So stay tuned and subscribe as we make more videos distilling complicated crypto subjects in a short and easy to watch format. The crypto industry moves fast and it's hard to keep up. So you can let Bankless do the heavy lifting for you as we explore the crypto frontier together. Thanks for watching.